We're back the third and final part of tonight's evening. Uh, and so we have Lewis, who's going to be talking about left brain, right brain bullshit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't mind it, but the bit before it is bullshit. The bit, uh, <laughs> anyway, please welcome Lewis to the stage. Thank you. <laughs> So a wee bit about the brain. So who's heard of the left and right brain differences? Okay, so who thinks, so what's the left? Is it, shout out. Typically dominant in right-handers. Okay, okay, that's interesting. Any other things? Emotions. Emotions, yeah. So for the, which one? Left or right? Left. No? Well, I mean, <laughs> what I've heard, is, you know, you get those Facebook messages and it's like, oh, left. If your left brain is like really super scientific, and if you're right, you're really artsy. Who's heard of that? Yeah, that kind of divide. Okay, well, that's the bullshit. <laughs> Hopefully, the next bit isn't going to be bullshit. So, uh, I'm one of these frauds. I'm not actually doing a PhD, I managed to, but I am doing research. Uh, I've not done that whole yet. But what I'm looking at is, well, left right differences. The, the awkward thing is basically, you've heard all this pop psychology about the differences between the hemispheres. But in, the awkward thing is, there are actually differences between their hemispheres, but then it's not that. Okay? As you might expect, it's a wee bit more nuanced, it's a little bit more exciting than that. So, first, I'm going to give you a quick, well, neuroanatomy lesson. Okay, so you have the brain. Um, I'm not really an artist, but we're going to give it a go. Okay, this looks more like a whale. But <laughs> <laughs> right? It's a Pac Man. It's a Pac Man with. <laughs> Something gills. Um, <laughs> now, the brain. First question, how many pints, if I smoothie your brain, would it fill? Two and a half pints. Huh? Two and a half. Perfect! You knew that before. Two and a half pints. If you smoothie your brain, give it back. Okay, depending where about you are. That's a half. Um, a, a very it is a glass of half. Okay. So <laughs> If you think about it, it's pretty much a little bit bigger than your hand. So can you all get your hands out for me? Okay, so it's going to be very liberal. It's going to be a little bigger than this, you hope. There's a left and there's a... Right. Good, <laughs> good, just checking. Right, so you've got a right. So, unfortunately, the brain isn't this simple. But you'll see you've got your fingers, which are kind of what we call the gyri. Okay, so the things that stick out. And then you've got the wrinkles. Now, your brain is really, really wrinkly, and these are called sulci. Now, what I'm interested in is sulci and the shape of the brain, because as I said, they're actually quite asymmetrical, generally speaking. So, first off, if we have your hands left, right, your brain is actually kind of almost like coffee shape. It's called, we call it a talk. So, it's actually more like, let's have a look. Don't laugh. Okay, so that, that's the left. Okay, you see this kind of, it overlaps at the back, so this is the front of the brain, and that's the back. And then the right kind of overlaps a little bit over here. Okay, so typically speaking, we're talking about 70, 80% of the population, we have this. Okay, now in terms of sulci, the one I'm most interested in, and in fact, I'm going to, little thing, I'm going to pass this one. So this, okay, is actually my brain. It's not this size, okay, just to show you, but it's about half size in my left hemisphere without the cerebellum. So I'm going to pass that around. Um, there is some basic lesions, because I, I zombified it, but that's a different story for a different day. <laughs> but if you want to pass that around, you can touch my brain. What I'm interested in is basically this sulci, for example. So this sulci is called the sylvian fissure. So this is the front of the brain. I don't know, it's not F. And it's the back. Okay. And over here we've got the top of the brain and the bottom, just in case. So you're orange. The sylvian fissure is basically just along where your knuckles would be. All right, so we're talking about it's going from pretty much here. Well, it's going in this way. Now, sylvian fissures are interesting because there's a sim asymmetry, and the asymmetry is generally speaking leftwards. So we have the left, which will be red, which is longer compared to the right, and the right also tends to be higher. But that's by the way. So let's do this. Okay. Now, why is that interesting? Well, this is the part of the hemispheres, basically, where we process two important things. 
sound and language. Now, who's right-handed here? Put your hand up if you're right-handed. Okay, oh, let's do it easier. Le Left-handers? Okay, about, yeah, that's about roughly about right. We're talking about 10% of the population. Not that you know which hand is hand, which is which, but it's about 10% of the population. But in most people, language is left lapwise. That means when, well, anyway, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So, for example, Articulate language, so that's basically the part of the languages where we talk about very specific aspects like when I say cat, I mean a cat, I don't mean a dog, that's the point of language, it's very specific. And so things like grammar are represented in most people, about 90% of right-handers, 95% of right-handers, and in left-handers maybe 70-80% uh, is on the left. Now what's interesting is that it's not only in the left though, because you always have language faculties on the right, but what's interesting is on, in the right it's much more about context. So if you have a stroke, you have brain damage to the right side of the brain, okay, so this is from up over here, this is the silver picture. You might understand what the words are saying, but you don't necessarily understand the context. So if you said it's raining cats and dogs out here in Glasgow, you'd be looking for cats and dogs, and you'd probably find some. But <laughs> <laughs> they won't understand, for example, the tone of your voice. If you say, oh, how are you doing? It's like, oh. I'm fine. They might understand these specific words, but they won't understand the context, they won't understand humour. So right, there's a general kind of organisation difference in the sense that the right can be much more contextualised and the left is much more specific. So if you have a stroke from the left, they won't understand the words, but they might understand your tone. Does that make sense? Good. So, why is this overall really interesting? Well, as I said, we have this leftward asymmetry in terms of function, in terms of actually speaking language, okay, the very precise aspects of that at least. And we also have this structural correlates. So basically, we have this example where the left side of the brain in that region is actually longer in terms of this wrinkle. So whether or not they're connected is actually a very, very complicated question, but it's, what it's nice about it is it's actually a very, very good landmark. So what I'm doing is basically measuring these landmarks using MRI scans, so we get someone into a big donut essentially, biomassic magnetic field to them, and then we get data. We can look at this data, reconstruct the sulci, and I'm able to do it in 3D compared to back in the past where people used to basically get a brain and prod it. <laughs> Literally, I'm putting in bin bags, I kind of hope for best. I, mean, I think that one's bigger. So we can do it in 3D now using actual data, which is great. And I'm doing it in three different populations, and that's what I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about next. So, the first population we're looking at are chimpanzees. So, we also have chimpanzee brain scans. Now, why might you think we might be looking at chimpanzees and looking at this region? So much as human brain. Yeah, exactly. So, chimpanzees are probably one of our closest relatives. We probably, um, our common, last common answer was about six million years ago. And their brains are remarkably like ours, but simpler, which is great for studying them. They also have the silvan fissure. So what if, if, let's say go with the hypothesis that silvan fissure is important and might be related to language, chimps don't unfortunately have the language, at least to the extent that we do. I mean, that can be a very arguable effect, but certainly not to our extent. So what if... That asymmetry that we have in our brains isn't in chimps. Is, could it be related to how language has evolved, basically? So it's a structural, it might not even be one-to-one -one correlation, but we're talking about a structural possibility <laughs> linked to our development of language. So that's what I do. So I'm looking at chimpanzees and basically also using MRI scans. And then we're basically looking at their brains. I can't draw a, ch a chimpanzee. Basically, it's a, small, <laughs> it's a smaller one of these. <laughs> it's a third of the size of this. It's very small. You get the idea. Pac Man. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> we have the chimpanzees. That's one population. And why is that interesting? Well, so, as I said, it's the evolution of language. Well, I'm also not going to write the silver. Another population we're looking at, so within humans, is we're also looking at psychiatric cohorts. 
so in specific, oh, I mean, okay, another Pac-Man, <laughs> maybe a little bit less, okay? So, all these, so these are important, what's very interesting about these asymmetries is they show up very, very early on. So they show up from, actually, um, when you're newborn. We can see it in MRI scans from that early. And so, now, our understanding of those psychiatric diseases are the complex relationships between uh, with the genetics environment, and they have a massive developmental aspect to them. And so, whether or not we can also find these asymmetries in psychiatric cohorts might be suggestive of developmental problems within brain development very, very early on. It could be a risk factor. There's been quite a lot of literature looking at this as a possibility. Now, it's not very complex, which is actually great. It's a really simple market in terms of looking at this wrinkle and seeing if it's long enough, because, it, because it's so simple, you can use it in big cohorts. So that's the third, and I'm really running out of time, but the last one is actually within controls, we're looking at musicians. Now, I, I've played the fiddle myself, and why that is interesting is basically, this is not the same fish anymore, but I'm looking at the central sulcus. Now, the central sulcus is basically, if you imagine wearing a headband, we've all been there, guys, um, <laughs> ear to ear, okay? This is going to basically demark uh, the central sulcus, and if this is the top of the brain, left and right, it basically looks a little bit like this. Now, Tim talked about cocks, and I think uh, Becky talked about uh, knobs. I'm also going to talk about knobs. This <laughs> is the central sulcus. Woo! And just over here, right at the top, is something called the hand knob. I'm not kidding. Okay? Now, the hand knob is basically. <laughs> A wrinkle, it's this omega sign, and what's really interesting, you can measure how curved this is. Now, in most people, there's a slight increased curvature in the right hemisphere, uh, left hemisphere, sorry, because most people are right handed, a slight increase of use of right hand. Now, musicians are great because musicians have actually enlarged hand knobs. <laughs> um, now, what's really good about this is that actually it doesn't matter, presumably because of the increase of use. Hands, but it also depends which instrument you play. So as a violinist, what we found, for example, is that you'll find an asymmetric enlarged hand knob. So because the focus is on the left hand, you actually get it more on the right. Whereas if you're a pianist, you have symmetrical hand knob. <laughs> I, I, I haven't drank far enough of this. But anyway, so why is this important? Well, so this is a very different direction, but this is actually one of the most established uh, <coughs> examples of what something we call experience dependent plasticity, which is a really big word for basically saying, because we, we learn stuff, our brain changes. Okay? And it's really, and musicians are great because you can quantify it. You can say they've been studying it for this amount of time, and they've reached this grade, and we can correlate that with the size of their hand <laughs> So, with all these three different things, I still don't have any of the answers, but you can see that the actual picture of the asymmetric brain is actually much more interesting than just art 